coming out to here. And I think Sister Pope made a very great statement because that's really where my mind has been. And, you, you know, you don't get what you really don't expect a lot of times. You, there is an expectation in God. You know, there's what they call a hope in God, expectation. And a lot of times is that we expect very little from God. Very small. When it comes to the things of God, the thing that God has for us, our expectation are not that great to obtain those things. I heard some guy just this week, I listened to him on the radio, and he was just saying how distracted most people are in this world. And the value that we place on things in this world is if somehow... It adds value to your eternal life. See, there's nothing you add to that that increases your internal life. There's nothing like the Mormons, I think, they have a teaching where they believe they were all spirits one time and, and they got assignments to come down and grab a hold to a body. And when they come down here, they can increase their level when they go back if they do more stuff down here while they're here. And so that's why you'll see most Mormons will gladly spend two years knocking on doors, get slammed in the face with them doors. But they believe that the better they do down here, it makes it better for them when they get up there where they were. They want to increase whoever they had to increase in heaven. Well, I, I, of course, I do not buy into that. I don't think that the things that God give you, they're perfect in every sense of the word. God doesn't give you imperfect peace. Whatever God gives you is perfect, okay? Now, now you, you, you may not be the perfect specimen, but the stuff he gives you is perfect. He doesn't give you an imperfect Holy Ghost. You know, I, I, used to, I remember when we first started, people used to talk about, man, they got the Holy Ghost, but they didn't get no joy. Well, you didn't get the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you, you can't get the Holy Ghost without getting everything that comes with the Holy Ghost. You didn't, he didn't give you the Holy Ghost, then kept joy back from you. That, that wouldn't even make sense. See, the Holy Ghost is a complete package. It, it has everything in there that you'll ever need on this side and the next side. So we're not serving an imperfect God. He has a perfect plan. He has a perfect purpose. And so we need to understand that how we try to come to God, we got to see him in his perfection. See, that's why the Bible tells you it's about knowing God. God is perfect. Everything about him is perfect. There is nothing about God that's not perfect. That's the reason why you can count on God if, if you got a trial, it's a perfect one. <laughs> Ain't nothing lacking. <laughs> but when he sent his deliverance, guess what it is? It's perfect deliverance. But I think that Somehow we begin to sell God short because we want to keep this experience in an imperfect place. A lot of times we read the Bible and looked at the different things that's in the Bible and we compartmentalize part of the story and left the other part out. And what I mean by that is that when you start in Genesis, you start reading the Bible, from the word in the beginning, God. It's the start of a story. It's the start of a story of salvation. And all the different ways and all the different stories that's being told, the same story is being told but expanded. Adam and Eve in the garden. God created this man. He was a perfect specimen of humanity. God breathed into him. Gave him the breath of life. In other words, when I say perfect specimen, he probably had 10 of these and 10 toes. 
The only thing that Adam probably wouldn't have had, guess what? What do you think he didn't have? He didn't have no umbilical cord. He didn't have an umbilical cord. He wasn't cut for nothing. He was made from the dirt. All right? So he didn't have a belly button. <laughs> I thought I thought out that. It's here, no, there, it's not. I mean, we had guys arguing over the fact. Well, did Adam have a belly button? It, it really don't matter. If he had one, didn't do him no good. If he didn't have one, it still didn't do him no good. So we're not going to fight over whether or not he did or didn't. But I thought I'd throw that in because the only thing you'll have an umbilical cord is something that was born into this world. Okay. But we need to understand when we talk about salvation and what does it entail. Because most people, when they look at salvation, salvation was not an afterthought of God. It was a beginning thought. Everything God has done, you know, for the Lamb of God was slain before, before the foundation of the world. So we see in the mind of God, he had a plan before anything ever went wrong. That's why you don't stand around and argue with people, you know, what if Adam never sinned? No, what if, what if he did? Because he did. <laughs> okay, you ain't going to go back and change that. Ain't no what if in this. And I, and I honestly believe that it was all in the plan of God. Because Adam was not the, the total purpose of God. He was only the process. God was going to use him to process his purpose. Without the first Adam, there cannot be a second Adam. Now, what's the difference between these two Adams? One had a... <laughs> one had an umbilical cord and the other one didn't. <laughs> So, you think on that. I know y'all. But so, we want, we want to look at tonight, what I want to look at just for a minute. Because I, I think that most people are unaware that God had a purpose that was greater than you dying and one day going to heaven. If that's all God wanted to do, he'd just wait and kill you and save you at the day before he killed you so he can get you in heaven. But you notice... He saves you, and he keeps you here. For what? Well, he has a plan and a purpose for our lives. He, he didn't just save somebody because, you know, we, we get excited. Man, thank God he saved me from the devil. Well, that wasn't no problem for him. He'd already whooped him already. You know, it was like taking candy from a baby, so it wasn't like, that was something hard for him to do. He's already done the hard work for each one of us. And that's why when I hear people saying how hard it is to be saved, well, you really ain't done the hard work. The hard work was done by him. All the hard work he took care of. All he asked you to do was believe him. That sounds like easy work to me. It is easy until you try to get involved and save yourself better than he has saved you. The problem is you can't improve. And we try hard to improve without understanding his salvation. Because once you understand his salvation, you know you can't improve on it, but you can't accept it. And when you accept his salvation, you get his salvation. God is my savior. Guess what? That's, that's not just a part-time job. <laughs> he saved you every minute. And we feel like most of the time we kept ourselves in the first place because so, that's when we fail. And then the first thing we say then, I'm going to ask God to save me. 
Well, he, he was saving you all the time. He is the only Savior you have. So I want to talk about a purpose of God. I think we read a lot of stories and we read a lot of things in. I remember teaching uh, Search for Truth Bible Studies and I had, had it down to a science and, and I would go through and study the charts and, and had the tabernacle plan on it. And of course we get, we uh, confirm our salvation by looking at the pattern and we came up with the idea that, you know, here we got a lamb slain in Egypt. They came through the Red Sea. And then when they came through the Red Sea, they built a tabernacle. Well, we used to, I used to teach from a tabernacle plan is that when the tabernacle was established, I could teach salvation from there. And then we had the brazen altar, the label of water that you washed in, and then you went into the holy place and then the holies of holies. And so you would take and use those symbols to ex explain salvation. Brazen altar was repentance. Label water was baptism. Which really, when they went along with the true scope of things, because if we go back, we will see death in Egypt. We see him baptized in the Red Sea. Matter of fact, I think the book of Jude talks about it. Uh, a book of Hebrews talks about it, that they were baptized under Moses in the Red Sea. So we got baptism. We got repentance and baptism. And then we got the tabernacle, which is a completed structure, which was within itself, had all the things that we, uh, the bread, lamps, oil, uh, ark of God, Love seat of God, throne of God. It was all there in that tabernacle plan. It was a completed plan. And the only thing about when they got to the completed plan, only a very few could really participate. See, a lot of people never even got no further than the brazen north. They never got past that. That's about as far as they could go. Then you had another set of people that all they done was hung out at the brazen altar, burning and cleaning, sweeping, smelling guts all day. You had some that had a little bit more, and they went into the holy place. They got a chance to trim lamps, pour oil, and even cook bread. And then you had just one guy, once a year, top dog, he get a chance to go in a place where God dwells. Called the holies of holies. And it was so frightening and scary because there was no lights inside. It was all dark. And, and plus you got an incense burner. It's throwing off smoke and the house is filled uh, with the smoke. And, and uh, you got to go in here and shake blood. And they say if you do anything wrong, you don't get smite, smite, smitten, knocked down, killed. They tie stuff to people. They said, I don't know. They had to tie the rope around their leg in case they didn't come out. They could drag him out because nobody could go get him. You can't go get him. The little bells, he had pomegranates on, on the bottom. When you, heard, when you didn't hear the bells, you know something bad was happening. As long as he's in there, you got bells on the bottom, the tassels, and they're clinging, and he doing smoke. He can't see nothing. He cannot see a thing. But he's in the presence of God. He's done, done everything they told him to do to be the high priest. So I think we almost set church up on the same order as the old order. Believe it or not. Because we have people in our religious circle, they never go any farther than the brazen altar. As far as they go. That's all they know. Then you're going to have a few other people that believe more in the spirit. They go a little bit farther. The only sad part about this is, as good as the holy place was with the candlestick, the showbread, and all the incense, 
it took you to handle that business. You could not, it didn't just handle itself. If you didn't bake bread, guess what? You don't eat bread. If you didn't trim the lamps, that means that you're not going to get no light. If you didn't pour oil, if you didn't pour oil in it, then the light's, light's going to go out. It was up to you to put the incense on the altars, the altar of incense. It was up to you to do that. I don't think we understand exactly what Jesus came to fulfill. I don't think we really get it in our minds. Number one, that that tabernacle that we talk about, Moses' tabernacle, it really is not just a tabernacle, but it is a person. So ironic that, you know how long it took them to build that tabernacle? Nine months. Well, that just blow you mind. Why nine months? You know how long it took Jesus to be born? Nine months. <laughs> so when you look at Jesus and you understand that he is total, the total package, completed. That's why when you get in him, you get everything he completed for you. He's the one poured his spirit in you. You're not trimming lamps no more. Matter of fact, the Bible goes on in the book of Hebrews and talks about the high priest. What most people don't understand, when God got ready to judge Israel, you know why they got the break? It wasn't because they were good. You know why they got the break? It's because the high priest went in once a year and performed the sacrifice. And if God accepted that, the people's okay. Now, if God put that much into a man, how much more so your high priest? If he's all right, that didn't go over well, did it? Well, no. If he is the high priest, then if he's all right, you're going to be all right. Because the high priest's job was to wear that ephod, the breastplate, with all the stones of the tribes on his heart. Guess where you at? You're on the heart of God. He has completed the journey for you. Many of us say today, you know, I'm... I'm I, I, I'm, on a, I'm on a journey. Well, true that. But basically, to be honest with you, your journey is complete in him. He made the full track from death, hell, and the grave to raise up from there. And that's why we have to understand the resurrection of Christ. It's not an event. Resurrection is a person. You can't have Jesus without having a resurrected experience. Oh, uh, no, Brother Wilson, I, I, know, I know Jesus said he's resurrected, but we're waiting on one. Well, well, if he is the resurrection, what are you waiting on? He said, I am the resurrection. We have the idea and I'm not sure exactly how we got it, how it came into being. But I believe that Jesus wants to show you the beauty of his spirit. While we'll put that on hold and dream about a place we've never been. Nobody ever came back and tell you anything about it. I'm not denying heaven because heaven is a real experience. But I don't believe that what he had in mind for you living in heavenly places was not about you dying later on get to get that. What he gave you from heaven is to help you live here on earth also. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done in earth. That's where? But we're saying wait till we get to heaven. He's saying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Matter of fact, in the book, even in the old covenant, Moses chatting with those people. God's purpose was to make heaven for them here on earth if they just obeyed it. Adam, and I was riding down the road the other day, I got to thinking about this. See, God is not doing anything different now than he did in the beginning. We just haven't got restored back far enough to where it's just you and God. We still have a lot of things between us and God. But see, in the beginning, it was God and Adam. And like I said before, if he didn't need to talk in the beginning, if he needed to talk then, why do we think he don't need to talk now? We got a muted God. We got muted God. We got a God we talk to but never talk back to us. There's something wrong with that picture. Because I don't believe you went through all that to get with you and then all of a sudden you don't want to talk with you. There were things that kept God away from people. He mentioned that. Your sin has separated us. I've turned my back on you. Now all of a sudden Jesus come to answer the sin question so that he once again can reconcile himself to you. It's his reconciliation. It's on his terms and not yours. If he says, I've been reconciled, guess what? I've been reconciled. Well, you know, I don't know. I just don't feel like me and God's on good terms. He done the reconciliation. You know what I'm saying? He's the most powerful one in the covenant. If he says, I'm reconciled, I'll accept that. I'll be reconciled. Okay, God, because I'm reconciled based upon his determination, not mine. So, in the book, in uh, the book of Joshua, let's turn there real quick. Book of Joshua. This is one of these. And, it, and it's, it's strange how songs have messed up so many things. You know, you sing a lie as well as tell a lie. A lot of songs have really messed up stuff. I mean, growing up, I used to hear that song, uh, Down by the Jordan River, Waiting on that Chariot Ride. And uh, I used to, Dreaming about Canaan land. You know, you hear people talking about going to Canaan land, going to Canaan land. We got a lot of songs, especially old songs, talked about going to Canaan land, going to Canaan land. And so I think it's important that we get the right spiritual perception of Canaan land. What, is, what was Canaan land? Well, was it supposed to be heaven? Huh? Go. It looked like to me, if it was, it was messed up. Because they know more than get over there and things started falling apart. The wheels started falling off the cart. They weren't over there long before people then got killed. They weren't there long before all of a sudden there's giants coming down the hills and stuff. Even, even to the place that they were getting defeated. So, I think we need to back up and try to see how this story is being told and, and what does it hold for you and I. Because here we got at Joshua, let me see, three and one. I'll read a couple, few verses here. Joshua rose early in the morning. They removed from Shittim, came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. It came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. They commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant 
of the Lord your God and the priests and Levites burn it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. And that's very important because the ark was not something you've seen every day. You go a whole year without seeing the ark. The only time, and really, they didn't even get to see it when it wasn't behind the curtain because when they moved the ark, they used to cover the ark. So it wasn't like everybody would see the ark or know what the ark really was. They heard the story, I'm sure, about behind the curtain. You know, there is an ark that's the glory of God where the ark is. I'm sure they heard all those stories, but they really, personally, most of them had never seen that. So what we have is that here's the setting. You got them coming to this place. They done spent three days there. And, you know, it's, it's like they ain't, they've been there before. But it seems like every time they get to that place, something happens. And they take another lap. God left them and left them until they drop dead out there. You know, one of the things that really, I don't, we underestimate the power of unbelief. Man, we'll kill you over any sin that we think is a sin, but we will allow you to have unbelief and still be okay. It'd be one thing if God thought the same way, but he don't. I don't, I didn't, I haven't seen anything in this book that causes God to be more angry than that one sin called unbelief. How bad is it? It killed a whole human race. <laughs> It killed the whole human race. You know, you know why you're dying? You know why you got an expiration date on your life? It's because somebody fell into unbelief. One man quit believing because the Bible said he was not deceived. He was, but he wasn't. So he would have to go and just literally not believe to eat the fruit. I know we can go through all them romantic stories and sentimental things about how much he loved Eve and he couldn't live without her and so he went on and ate the fruit so they could live together forever. Well, see, his name was Adam. See, my name was Kelly. If that had been me, and my wife would have partook of the fruit. Ain't no sense in both of us dying. I got to be there to tell the kids. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You got to have somebody back to tell the story. I, I need to stay back, tell that story for her, since she won't eat the fruit. But, but it, once again, I don't believe that's by accident. Because the story... It's deeper than just Eve eating the fruit and Adam partaking willingly. It was showing two things in reverse order, though. Jesus take and willingly took on a likeness of you, took on all of the sins of the world that got contaminated by the fruit that the first Adam ate, he took it all on him to do away with it. Difference in the atoms. So here is that first Adam showing he was willing to die for his wife. You know what Jesus was willing to do? He was willing to die to get one. <laughs> see, see, Jesus didn't get a wife and die for her first. He died first to get that wife. Adam had a wife that he died for her. 
The only sad part about him dying for her, he couldn't say neither one of them. Nothing he could do for her. Nothing he, she could do for him. But Jesus just, just the opposite. He died for you. And guess what he does in exchange? He gives you life. You give him your death. And he gives you his life. But how many of you know we don't care too much for his life like we care for ours? Uh-oh. What do you mean, Brother Wilson? Well, we investigate our life a lot. We know a lot about us. Do you know a lot about him? Because the life that's going to count in your life is not going to be your life. Romans 5 and 8 said we are, it's by his life that we are saved. So now, if it's his life that counts, then I need to make sure I understand his life because that's the one that counts. Most people have not realized that when God calls us to salvation, he had a purpose because there is a need for a release of our world. But it's not going to be done by will these serving what they call good Christian people. It's going to be done by the purpose he set forth to do. That's why the Bible talks, I think it is, he talks about uh, uh, for the whole creation, moaning and groaning, waiting for the manifestation of another church. Is that what it said? No, it said waiting for the manifestation of the what? Sons of God. I had a man, you know, good intention. I said, Brother Wilson, he said, I prayed and I asked God, make me a servant. I said, well, I didn't. I prayed and asked him, make me a son. He said, what difference does it make? It makes a big difference. See, sometimes we read the Bible, we don't read it. Hear this, a servant do not know what the master, did he ask you to pray to be a servant? Because if he did, he had a servant and he called him out, my servant Moses. But then he said to Jesus, this is my Beloved servant, son, in whom I am well pleased. Did he say that about Moses? No. And I know you think I'm playing on words. I'm not playing on words. No, because the Holy Ghost that birthed you into this world was born from the Son of God. It is that spirit that baptized you into one body. He wasn't looking for servants anymore. He was looking for sons. Because you know why? The inheritance is not given to servants. But he will take care of the servants. You're not going to have servants and not feed them. But as far as them wearing the ring... The Lord ain't going to send you to the grocery store with the insignia. But his son, everything the father has is his. No place in the Bible would he say that about a servant. Even when you read about Abraham, he got a servant in the house. Abraham knows he ain't supposed to inherit this. And I hear people all the time, they all, man, we're the bride of Christ. This is the reason why eschatology is so important. This is the reason why you need to know the difference in your eschatology. Because your eschatology, if it's wrong, your salvation is messed up. If you're called 
to be a bride than be that. But he got a bride. The book Pentecost is the same shadow you see in the old covenant where they had the stone. Remember what he talked about? You had the fire, the cloud, and you had a stone that they drank from. And the Bible tells you that down that same rock that, that followed them, didn't lead them. It makes a difference. Because the Bible says a son is led, is led. The, the servant he followed. That's the reason why when we get to the Jordan River, it's no longer following. He's no longer following them. He goes to the forefront in the shape of that ark. But then he says something real strange then. He said, now when you see it. See, a lot of people say, boy, it's everybody. No, it wasn't. It was for only those that could see it. It's almost like in the house of Cornelius when it's preaching. The only one that got the Holy Ghost and the only one that got saved was the one who heard the word. Just because everybody said it was there don't mean they heard the word. We see Jesus uh, uh, at, at Lazarus' tomb. Said a voice spoke, some thought it was thunder, others heard. Just because we all in the same place, I mean we heard the same thing. It's where your heart is, did you hear what God said? So I think I'm I think I done brought you up to where we need to be. So here we got them coming to the the brink, come to this place, Gilgal. Once again, it's not new to them. They've been there before. They've been tracking 38 years, 40 years. They got close. Have you ever felt like in your spiritual experience, you know, I know we use a lot of stuff like, boy, God almost did it. Man, oh, just this close. God almost done a miracle. No, God doesn't almost. No. No. He doesn't almost. He, God almost gave me a miracle. No, God don't almost. If God's given a miracle, it's a miracle. Not almost. He doesn't do almost stuff. Everything God does, he does with purpose. All things are created by him. And who? For him? For, for real? The corn's on my toe. I don't know what he's getting out of that deal. <laughs> yeah, it probably is because it, it almost makes you curse. No. <laughs> no, but anyway, Gilgal, it came to Gilgal. Gilgal, it means going around in a circle. It means go around, whirl around. And a lot of people have been to Gilgal many times. It's that circle you go, you know. This year, you almost crossed over. You almost did, but you didn't. So guess what happens? You go back around the circle. Now, how many times you think, if you have to ask yourself, how many times you think you've been around that circle? Bunches. You know, you'll make proclamation with your mouth. And then God will call it. And you got to pay for it? Not really. But you make proclamation, man, man, they don't let nothing separate me from God. And also you make this, that proclamation. And then God brings you to Gilgal. He brings you to a place now since you made that proclamation, all you got to do now is step. But then you know what happened? Every time God brings you to that place again, it's never as easy as you thought it was. Because when you begin to really see what you got to do to do it, then you start thinking maybe it's not worth doing it. It's kind of like these guys here. Now, God had walked these other people to death. Because if you remember, there was not one feeble one among them. 
And we've got to take that in consideration. And why? Were there not any feeble people? Why wouldn't there be some feeble people? You're out here in the desert. You ain't got no energy drinks. Because they was eating manna that came down from heaven. Angel food, they called it. They was eating manna. And you remember what he told them about the lamb a long time ago? They ate that lamb. They ate it every year. Every Passover, they had to eat that lamb. Part of eating the lamb was that you got to eat it all, though. And just as sure as I'm standing here, I know these people that's coming out of Egypt was like Americans. We're only going to do something for so long, and we ain't going to keep doing it. We're going to start taking shortcuts. Somebody's going to decide that, well, you know, I don't really care for, I don't care for that, that lamb head and stuff. I, I just like the chops. So I'm not going to eat the chops. See, with God... You can't pick and choose on the menu. You got to eat the whole roll. Okay? If he said eat the whole lamb, guess what you got to eat? Some of you say, but I don't eat no lamb intestine. If he said eat the whole lamb, guess what you got to do? Eat the whole lamb. Now, is that hard? But just as sure as I'm standing here, you're going to have somebody say, now, do you see that? I don't believe God want me to eat the intestines of the lamb now. I don't mind eating the head or, or, the, or the lamb chop, but I ain't eating all them intestines. It's funny when God put it in the word. He said, eat the whole lamb, roast it, pertinence. In case you don't know what the pertinence are, in the hood we call them chitlins. They want to, you got to cook that whole thing. You didn't get to empty the intestines, clean them out like we do at Chitlin. He ain't got nothing but some grass in him. Salad. Processed. <laughs> yeah, but that, that, that's what we do with animals before we kill them now. We'll put them in a place. So how? how, 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 how uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Feed them corn and clean them out real good. Yeah, well, they, they probably done some things with them, with them lambs and things because you did have to keep them up for four days. And you didn't, it, and like you when I think grab one, you had them for four days, check them out for fleas and mites and things like that. And they probably was feeding them some, some kind of spices and herb to make the stuff taste better, you know. Uh, but you had to eat the whole thing. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But see, what I'm saying is that he made them eat the whole lamb. Cook him and started eating. Man, that sounds like a real good feast. Well, yeah, you're going you're gonna to take the hair off of him. But I'm saying, though, the other parts, the meat, the pertinence, you know, all that stuff on the inside there, everybody should have something on their plate. Right? Because, see, what happened is this. We'll fail to do what God says and wonder what happens because of that. That should not have been one sick person in Israel. All they had to do was do what God told them. It should not have been one. Even if they got sick, God has set up laws. If you got an issue, had the law of issue, how to get rid of an issue. And yet we find a woman over in the New Testament. She has an issue of blood. But there are places in the word of God under the old covenant that they had to address that. But somebody didn't have time. There were so many things when Jesus came that was happening in the promised land. And, you know, I, I feel like this, though. It took a lot of faith for them probably to stay in the promised land being like they were. You know, the guy laying at the pool. I mean, at least he knew one thing. There's hope in the promised land. For 38 years, he was just like his predecessors. 
He'd been around that pool for 38 years. And then Jesus come. You know what, how we do after 38 years and Jesus haven't really been in our life? When he shows up, we won't recognize him. We'll try to give excuses why it, we shouldn't uh, obey him now. What did God say? I don't have nobody to help me. Well, you're in a good place. That's one of the best places you can be in. If you can say, I don't have nobody to help me and Jesus is talking to you, I'm glad I don't have nobody. <laughs> Because when you get him, you got everything. You got everybody. He said, man, you know, I would have I would have got healed, but every time I get ready to step into the water, somebody beats me. And here is the real healer here. Take up your bed. I ain't got nobody to help me. You got Jesus. If he's talking, that's all the help you're going to need today. And if you'll do what he says, you'll get up and walk. But here we got all these people that are sick in the leprosy. Did you know they had a law of leprosy? Did you know they had a way of curing leprosy before under the old covenant? And yet, we got lepers. We got issues of blood. We even got people dying. We got all kinds of things happening. And yet Jesus come to demonstrate his purpose. So now, if these people were eating manna, natural lamb and was there was not one feeble one among them could you explain to me then if they was eating natural stuff and stay strong how is it that we're eating spiritual things and weak as water explain that to me They had, we are having more problems with the Holy Ghost than they had without it. Well, anyway, came to Gilgal, going around in a circle where most people are. The footsteps they see is the one they had last year. They think they follow new ones, but it's theirs. And all they're going to do is end up in the same place every year. We have annual things every year. We're going to have a spiritual blow up, a spiritual blowout. Lasts for 24 hours. And then we're back waiting for next year so we can do the same thing again. And, I, you know, it's like we say things like we need revival. We, we need to be revived because we have not recognized what lives in us. If we understood what lives in us, you got light. The life you want to be revived to is in you. But you got to, in order for you to claim revival, you got to first let God know you're dead. You know why? Because he has to revive the dead. But most Christians ain't going to say they're dead. Say, I'm just struggling. Y'all pray for me. Pray for me. I, I'm telling you. We need to learn what we got in us. We need to understand the revival, the life, the strength, the energy that you're looking for, it ain't going to come from out there. It's going to come from in here. God has set up residence in your heart. And you don't have to worry about when you can talk to him because you can talk to him all the time. And if you would just kind of quiet down, he'll talk back to you. Yeah, but I ain't, I ain't heard God. But you know, we start reading these things in the Bible sometimes, and we want God to recreate a lot of things we read in the Bible. You know, he, I, we want to be like sitting before the throne and falling out as if we are dead kind of stuff. You know, everybody didn't have those experiences, but every now and then you get a prophet, Daniel, the Lord shows up, he falls down on his face like dead. John, all these guys, it sounds so great that they got a chance to experience that. But if you never experienced that, remember one thing, that same God lives in you. 
He lives in you and you still have him bowed. He's on the outside of them. And they all fell on their face as if they were dead. There's so much life in Jesus. So much more life than we want to give him credit for. But anyway, here they're going around in a circle. And, you know, usually when you go around in a circle long enough, you know what you'll get, right? You'll get in a rut. <laughs> you get in a rut. How many of you ever felt like you've been in a rut? <laughs> you know why you've been in a rut? Because you've been walking around the same. You know, that's, that's why I used to like growing up. You always knew where everybody went because they had a path. Nice, shiny, dirt path. You knew everybody went that way. Because rarely do you see people making tracks across weed. They usually like to go where somebody's been and made a rut for them. A lot of people are living in spiritual ruts because they've been going around the same circle. And, and you know, we'll say, I, I heard preacher burnout. They haven't even believed in that stuff. They haven't even believed in that you really could get a preacher burnout. You know what I found out? You know when I got burnt out? It's when I was trying to preach good sermons. What do you mean? Well, real simple. I was living in that second dimension where we cook our own bread. <laughs> See, there's nothing wrong with having the Holy Ghost because, see, in the second dimension, it's you and God. It wasn't that I was doing wrong, but I was cooking, spending a lot of time trying to bake that bread right. I want to make sure when I feed it, they eat it right. I wasn't in the place where God gives the message. I was in the place where I helped make the message. Uh, and you're saying, Brother Wilson, what are you saying? Well, what I'm saying is this. There's a lot of things that we do to help God, but that's the wrong dimension. That's good to start, but eventually it's got to be him all in all. All right? When you get to the dimension, you can't see. He sees everything. He knows everything. And when he said, I want you to come sit with me in heavenly places, he's not talking about, there was no chairs in the second dimension to sit in. None. One none even in the first. There was only one place in the tabernacle of Moses where there was even a seat. And they called it a throne. Jesus come to make known to you, I have made you to sit together with me. If he's sitting with, if I'm sitting with him, there are no seats in just getting the Holy Ghost. I got to get to the next dimension to sit. But most people don't want to go to that dimension of knowing because it's dark. I remember reading, and I think in the one of the prophets, Zechariah may have been said, the day of the Lord is not a day of light. See, in our minds, we say God is light. He is so much light that when you see him, your understanding is so dark that it'll look dark because you lack the pure, perfect understanding of God. And so the day of the Lord was not going to be a day of light, but it's going to be a day of darkness because the reason why it's going to be a day of darkness is because flesh can't work. That's the reason why when you get in the book of Genesis, you notice one thing. He gave man daytime to see what he's doing. But God worked from evening through the night because only he can see in the dark. But he put man, gave him 12 hours to get his job done. But God started work when nighttime came, when no man can see. One spoke, well, I mean, we can now. We got... Some new inventions. We got them night vision now, but back then they didn't have night. <laughs> nah, they didn't have to do with anything. So he comes, he comes, we come to 
this place called Gilgal. And all of a sudden, they've been here three days. Now it's time for God to give some instruction. You know, another part where God is so hard is waiting. You know, it, it is really hard. Waiting on God is not easy. The only time we can wait on God easy is because what we're waiting on, we don't care if we get it. But if it's something you really desire, if it's something that you really want, waiting on God can kill you. Because I, I don't know of anybody that moves as slow as he does. And he's not military. I know that. See, I'm more military. He's not military. I like punctuality. He doesn't. At least my punctuality. You know, God has his own time. You know that? You ever notice that? You don't know how many times I have put him on schedule and he didn't show up. Yeah, and then we made a song out of it. He may not be there when you want him. Yeah, but he done drove you crazy between the time that he finally got there, though. You got on got ulcers, gray hair. Yeah, because he really ain't on time. He don't, he don't ask. You know, don't tell God about the midnight thing. He, he don't understand midnight. People say, boy, he's coming at midnight. Well, he don't always come at midnight. His midnight ain't your midnight. See, he look at experiences sometimes that let it set the time. Wait for your day to get as dark as it can get. Midnight came. It may not be 12 at midnight, but it may be the darkest day you ever had. You know, like, you know, what they say, weeping may endure for a night, but, yeah, it, that don't mean 6 o'clock a.m. It can end any time. So it's not like God is on these timexes. He ain't on that at all. But anyway, they're sitting here waiting on him. And then the word came through the, Camp with great anticipation. Now, and I'm, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how they were feeling because all the old people that was kind of like over 40. Let me see. No, the 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of them, they, they weren't going to make that trip. I wonder how the kids was feeling seeing they done bird mom, dad. Granny and all of them out there in the desert. They, they were dropping like flies, being healthy as a tick and falling over dead. I'm sure that's very confusing. Wasn't nothing wrong with him. You know, have you heard people say, boy, he died this morning. Wasn't nothing even wrong with him. Must have been. He did. You, you didn't see it, but he did. But can you imagine in your mind? You're walking out here with your parents. They've been telling about, yeah, we're going to the land form with milk and honey. And every time you get close to it, they make an excuse. Huh? Hey, believe it or not, we have done this to a whole generation. Blanket them with a lot of problems. Man, one of these days, we're going to be over yonder. We need to take another left, though. It ain't the day. Can you imagine... Every year, taking your kid to Gilgal, stopping there and telling them, man, you know what God said? He's going to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> but it ain't right now. Let's take another lap. He finally had to walk these people to death. Had to literally kill them. So that he could have a generation who heard about it, heard about it, but now they're going to get a chance to experience. The only people over 40 that made it, Joshua and Caleb. And, there's a, and why did they make it? See, most people don't understand how devastated 
unbelief is. God was willing to wipe out a whole generation of people. Why? Was it because they were drinking coffee and got caffeinated? No. Because they beat their wives? No. Now, come on. Now, you don't believe God just killed him because of unbelief. You, 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 you think he did? Well, what's so bad about unbelief? Why, why would he just kill him like that for unbelieving? I'm going to tell you why. He told you without faith. Do you know what unbelief is? No faith. Now, I don't know why that upset God so much. I don't know why he would be upset with us like that. That he would dare just say, since you don't believe me, I'm going to walk you to death. Because see, one thing about God, when you get ready, you know, a lot of people talk about the promises of God, but you got to step where the promises are in God. It, it wasn't just a matter. They had the promise of God when they left Egypt. God already told me when they left Egypt, I'm going to give you a land that's flowing with milk and honey. He already told me. So they had a promise. But how many of you know, even though they talked about the promise, they never got the promise? How many of you know they walk around every year talking about the promise of God, but not a one of them even got a chance to possess the promise because of an evil heart of unbelief? Just because you talk the promise, I mean, you believe the promise. They had the idea, but they never believed it. I don't want to just talk about what God did or what I believe he can do. I want to receive the promise. I want to step where the promise is. Because you notice he said, you may know there's a promise land, but the only part you get out of there is where your soles or your feet can touch. It's not where your mouth walks, it's where your feet can walk. And so they needed to cross over, but just before I quit, though, look at God. He always asking us to do the impossible stuff, ain't he? How come God don't make it easy for you? You ever feel like he just makes it so hard? He brings them to the place where they can get the promise. Here's a little string, they say. It ain't that big. Not more than 50 to 100 feet across. That's not that big. But here God comes and says, but today, the day you're going to go over. Wouldn't you know the day he wants you to do it, it's the day it looks so impossible. Wouldn't you know God could have chosen any other time, but he chose harvest time, and he chose a time when the river was a mile wide and running crazy, and then he's telling you, all you got to do is go on the other side, and you're looking at that situation, and you're saying to yourself, there ain't no way I could make it. The best thing in your life is when you finally come to that place where you know you can't make it. And guess what you have to do? Is trust him that made it for you. We're going we're gonna to continue this maybe, maybe not. But anyway, I had a few more things I want to say because one of the things, they, they had to see something to move. You know what a lot of people are doing? They're moving without seeing anything. I think I told you Sunday 
The reason why Jesus was 100% because he realized he was a son. And he said this, I do always. Those things I see, my father do. God bless you tonight, question, Brother Creed.